Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com. I've been teaching chess to beginners and intermediate players since 1984, helping them to achieve a higher level of chess proficiency as well as teaching life skills that can be developed as a result of practicing the principles of chess. If you're a beginner or intermediate player, I can help you. And if you're interested in personal lessons, please contact me at the email address in the description below. Well, today's lesson is on analyzing your own chess games. It's one of the means by which we improve in chess. In fact, National Master Bill Richards said that it's the best way to improve your chess. In order to do that, of course, you need to have an accurate record of your chess games. When you go to a tournament, you want to record your games on a score sheet like this one. And then go over that game move by move looking for the mistakes that were made both on your own part as well as on the part of your opponent. Now a mistake is defined as any move where I can prove and demonstrate that there was a better move. If I can't absolutely prove it, we don't call it a mistake. But where we can show that there's a definite better move that is a mistake and by going through that process it'll help to develop our uh, calculative abilities our analytical abilities our visualization skills all necessary uh, things to improve in chess so if you have not yet learned to record your chess moves be sure to visit the scholastic chess lessons playlist and find the lesson on chess notation and learn how to write down those moves and practice writing down those moves. Whether it's a tournament game or a casual game, it's good to write down your chess moves. When I was a kid, my dad made me write every single game down, whether it was a practice game or a casual game in the living room, I had to write them all down. And uh, it is a good practice. Okay. So without further ado, let's log in to chess.com and show, let me expand the menu here on the side so that you can see what the menu items are. And I see that I'm blocking the information behind me. So let's go ahead and take my mug off of the screen because you don't have to see my face in order to hear what I'm teaching you. But I do want you to see any information that might appear over here. All right, when you're uh, getting ready to analyze your games, there are a couple of important things to keep in mind. Um, first of all, that you do not want to use computer assistance to analyze your game the first time through. Let me say it again. Do not use a analysis engine or any kind of um, computer software to review your game. Go over the moves yourself. Uh, if you have a copy of your PGN, you can paste it here, but if you wrote down the moves, chances are good that you don't have that yet. This will create the PGN. You can actually, under details, uh, type in your name. And type in your opponent's name. You can see it appears down here. You can put in your rating. My rating at the time of this game was 1848. Put in your opponent's name. 
Uh, RBJ Balamurugan Balamurugan His rating at the time was 1423. You can put the result here that white won. Uh, you can type in the event U.S. Chess Open. Um, you can type in the time control. I'm not going to fill in all this information. Uh, by termination, it's, uh, it means how did the game end? Yes, White won, but how did he win? White won by resignation. Uh, location, round, etc., etc. It was actually the third round ECO. We don't know the ECO yet. We'll put that in later. The date of the event, you can just click on it. Uh, find it in your calendar and just click on it, and it'll fill it in here for you. All right, once you have all that information plugged in, you can simply make the moves on your chessboard. And it's probably best to just type in the moves. Oh, turn this off. Click on the, the show lines box here. On, off. We want self-analysis on, show lines off. We don't want to get any hints from the computer whatsoever. So we'll leave that. In fact, this eval bar here can give you hints as it goes up and down. So let's also turn that off by going to our interface tab. Let me slow down here, just make sure you're catching it. There's a little gear wheel or cog wheel up here. If you click on it, you get this selection with three tabs. Click interface and where it says show evaluation bar, turn that off. Turn that off. Um, and uh, for the time being, let's just turn. I'm not sure what show best move. Show best move will draw an arrow for the best move. So let's turn that one off for now. And let's just turn all these off for just the time being. Show move classification. Uh, we'll turn them all off just to be sure. And then once we're done, we'll turn them back on. Okay. So on the first run through, we're not necessarily going to even evaluate. We're just going to enter the moves. If something jumps out at you, then yeah, maybe you might want to put down a note or an alternate line. But for the first time through, we're pretty much just going to put the moves in. Just copying them directly from our score sheet. He castled. Um, that, that was surely... A mistake or at least an inaccuracy so I will put a note a little question mark exclam here he should have uh, recaptured on on e4 here so that just jumps out at me so I won't make any notes right now I'll simply do a quick annotation and continue from there um, let's see. Oh, it was uh, castle d3 to defend the pawn, and that's the point, is he needed to capture this before I defended it. Then he played rook e8, then knight f3, bishop g4, oops, bishop, oh, it's his turn. <laughs> Hello. Bishop g4, h3, um, bishop e6, bishop g5, 
pinning the knight. Bishop e7. Develop my other knight. H6 hits the bishop. Retreat. And this was a clever little move here. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this would be a typical place where you want to spend more time uh, both when it happens on the chessboard. You want to spend more time thinking it through because you have several options here. You, you, can, you can capture a knight. You can capture the knight with the pawn. You can capture the bishop with the bishop. Since you have so many options, you want to give it extra thought when it comes up during the game. And then when you analyze this, you want to make sure you look at all those options um, thoroughly. Okay, so after knight takes e4, I played bishop takes bishop. Hitting his queen, he played knight takes knight. Hitting my queen, uh, I played bishop takes queen. And again, you want to consider whether taking the knight is better or trading queens is better. I decided to trade queens. And here I captured with the rook. I could have captured this. And we'll, again, we'll look at all that during the evaluation. I captured with the queen's rook. He captured my bishop with his queen's rook. I brought my king's rook to the open file. Um, he played bishop to d5, threatening to double and isolate my pawns. I didn't like that idea, so I retreated knight to d2. He traded rooks. And then rook to d6. His plan is to super attack on g2. f3. Plans to step out of any kind of nasties. Uh, rook to g6 was played. King to f2 was played. And then he decided to go back to uh, g6. Uh, e6 from g6. I traded. He captured with his pawn, and that's a mistake. That's probably a blunder. I'm going to put two question marks on it. It's a mistake because it traps his bishop. If I would have only played pawn to uh, c4, his bishop would have no safe where to go. Um, I didn't play pawn to c4. I was possibly running out of time. I played pawn to a3. I'm going to give that a double question mark. Again, we're not going to evaluate it in depth here. We just made a mental note that this is um, a blunder. And I know because I can already see that there was a better move. So pawn to a3. Um, king to f7. And in fact, I can right here, since I already know there's a better move, I'll, I'll just put it on here. And you can see it puts it in parentheses up here. We will go over it in depth here in a little bit. But Pawn to a3. He played king to f7, giving me the second opportunity. So that gets a double question mark. Because he gave me a second chance, and I declined the second chance. So that gets a double question mark. And then uh, king f6. And then finally I noticed, oh, and I may have been in time trouble or something. Uh... But I finally noticed that I could do this, and I finally did it. And that's going to give me... It's funny how many times that sat there um, before I noticed it. So he played... He just abandoned the bishop. He played king to f5. Pawn takes bishop. And I, I could have actually done something else, you know, perhaps uh, keep his king from coming over, 
because I don't actually have to take the bishop now that it's trapped. I, I wouldn't have to take it unless he made a freeing move like pawn to e5 or pawn to c5. So I don't necessarily have to take this right away. I did. It's not going to hurt me to take it right away um, because now I'm up a, an entire piece and should win the game fairly easily. g4 check. Again, it might have been a better idea to um, play h4 first to stop the king from coming over. Because when I gave g4 check, in fact, he did come on over. Um, so we'll look at that during the analysis as well. I played, and realizing that I made a boo-boo, I retreated my king so that I could defend my h-man. And then he played e5 here. And um, after e5, I played knight to f1. And I'm, I'm noticing now, and I don't know why I didn't notice it in the game, that if I would have just gotten this pawn out of the way, if my knight sits here, it is checkmate. And you can't capture your own pawn, so just move it out of the way and then checkmate. So I overlooked that. So it's very likely that knight f1 is a mistake, maybe even a blunder. For now, we're just going to give it a question mark exclam. We can change that to a full question mark or double question mark later. But for now, just to draw our eyes to it, and I will put this on the board as a a better alternative and we'll see if we can prove that when we get into the analysis phase all right so i, I missed that opportunity it seems uh just on first glance and uh let's see here after i played knight f1 though he trapped his own king he kind of helpmated himself a helpmate is when you make a move that helps your opponent mate you and you can see that if I have my knight here, it is checkmate. And so there are two ways to get there. I chose knight to g3. And um, that is where my opponent resigned. Now you're going to click save here. Um, you'll notice that the opening is c65, the Rai Lopez opening, Berlin defense, Beferweich variation. So it's not letting me enter anything here. Hmm, I thought I could change this. Um, I thought I could add this information later on. Maybe after I run the computer analysis, which we're not going to do yet. So we've basically entered the moves with very superficial and limited analysis. Now we go back and analyze it in greater depth. And there are some tools we'll use, not for the analysis portion, but for the openings. We will use the opening pedigree. You can see I have a database here of two and three quarters million games here at chess.com. And as you play the moves on the board, the pedigree appears in this panel here and it shows you all the possible replies and what their winning and losing and drawing percentages were and how often they were played. So as you can see, the most common reply to E5 is the Sicilian defense pawn to c5. And note that if you hover over that move, a pop-out tip appears with the name of that opening. French defense, Karokan defense, P5, 
Hertz defense, modern defense, which by the way is also known as the Robach defense, named for Karel Robach, Scandinavian defense, Alyekin's defense, named for world champion Alexander Alyekin. He was, let's see, Steinus Lasker Capablanca. He was the fourth world champion. Nimzovich defense, named for Aaron Nimzovich. Open defense, St. George's defense, Borg defense, uh, Car defense, Hippopotamus defense, Lemmings defense, Ware's defense, Barnes's defense, Duras's gambit, the Goldsmith defense. This one doesn't have a name. All right. So he played pawn to e5. Also, the current uh, Tabia name is going to appear at the top of this list. And um, King's Knight variation. I should point out, by the way, you can also click on this name and a new window will appear with information about that opening. And you can read about the opening. You can read about the pros and cons of the opening and get some ideas about the opening. You can see um, sometimes it'll tell you that certain famous players were um, using this opening frequently. And you can look up their games and see how they played the opening. These are all tools at your disposal um, to help you improve and to help you learn that. When we go back, uh, anyway, we can continue on. King's Knight variation and the Rai Lopez opening. And you can read about that opening, same thing. You can read some information about it, pros and cons, etc. So that's a very nice uh, tool here at chess.com that I don't know that any other um, chess app, software, or server offers that feature. As far as I know, that's unique to chess.com. Um, this is the classical defense to Rai Lopez's opening. And again, there are many ways to answer. You've got Morphe's defense, which is the most popular. And all along the way, you can click and get more information. Um, you've got the Berlin defense. You've got the Yanish defense or the Yanish gambit. The classical defense, the Fianchetto defense, Cozio's defense, Bird's defense, and on and on. Just go on down and hover over it to see what the names are of the different ways people can reply. And you can see the, the these games, by the way, are all involving at least one master in the game. All right, so bishop to c4, uh, c5 is the classical defense. King's side castle. And now this is the Beverwijk variation. Beverwijk is a, a town in the Netherlands. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's specifically in, in Holland. And you can see here the move that was played, bishop takes c6, is not the most popular move. Zuckertort's gambit is the most popular. It's a gambit because it's offering this pawn to the black knight. And you can see that gambit is 
usually decline. Most people will transpose back to the central variation by castling, but it can be accepted as well. Okay. And so um, what I like to do along the way here is I like to put the names of the openings in here. I like to come over here and I could just highlight it, hit control C, and then go back to my analysis pane, right click on the move, and I can comment before, comment after. I can clear all analysis, which you don't want to do, which reminds me, make sure you click save uh, every time you make a change, because if you accidentally clear the analysis, there's no way to retrieve it unless you have already saved it, then you can go get it from your analysis archive and reload it. So be sure if you clear all analysis. So it's always good to actually save every time you make a change. So we right click, we click comment after, and I do control V um, and Ray Lopez opening. And if I want, I could go over and copy all those notes that I had about the Ray Lopez opening. I can highlight this, cop control C that, <clears throat> and then come back to my board. And I can actually instead put that whole spiel in there. Now you notice that it doesn't keep the formatting, so you, you might have to edit this a little bit, but it says also called the Spanish game, the Ray Lopez is one of the most popular openings in chess. White's bishop to b5 uh, puts pressure on the knight, which is guarding the center. And that allows white to develop rapidly. It points out that the opening is named after the 16th century Spanish priest, Ray Lopez de Segura. And here I see already that there's no spacing there, so I'll put a space and prose. And I might just, instead of the bullets that it had in the actual thing, I might just put some numbers here. One, it leads to very complex and multifaceted play. Two, it tends to give white long-term pressure. Three, white develops rapidly and castles quickly. Put a period there, a space. So you do have to do some editing if you're importing text from another source. And you noticed that when I first pasted it, it was you couldn't see it here because the um, it it copies the formatting initially, but as soon as you as soon as you come out here, it gives you your your active formatting. Uh, and I've got this set up for the bright blue letters that are bigger, so it's easier for me to read. So you can set that up on your own. Um, but it'll copy the formatting of the source initially and paste it in this portion and uh, let's put numbers here on the cons as well one some lines are very theoretical which means there's a lot of uh, a lot of theory opening theory involved two black has a huge number of defenses from which to choose. And you might have to correct the grammar um, from which to choose. My mother would, would not allow me to end a sentence with a preposition. So I'm going to just change that. <laughs> um, three, sometimes Black gets a chance to later attack the light-squared bishop. 
All right, so you have those notes, and then you go on from there. Classical defense. And you may want to just, you, you don't have to copy, you can just type it in. You can just say classical. And I'm typing one handed if you're wondering why is it taking him so long to type. I've got one hand on the mouse, and I'm typing with my left hand. So classical defense. And I put in here, I've got A6 because that was the most popular. I might write myself a note saying Morphy's defense is most popular. This is all part of learning. And if I want to study the opening, now's the time to study it. And look at how this was played by masters. Look at the different lines. Kingside Castle. And this is the Bavervike variation. And since I don't know how to spell Bavervike, I'll highlight it, Control C. I mean, I, I do know how to spell it, but it's just going to be faster for me to copy paste it I would have to think about I know how to spell it but I, it's not like on the top of my brain I'd have to think about now how's that spelled against uh, uh, on the uh, on the typing portion Bavervike variation and if you want you can google Bavervike and and type some information there sometimes nice to know what what does Bavervike mean what is that well it's a it's a town in the Netherlands and you can Google that and read about it and give yourself an education. That's part of the fun of, of doing this. If you don't make it any fun, you, you can grow bored with it very quickly. Some people say, Coach Daniel, you're boring me right now. I'm fascinated by this kind of thing. All right, B takes, Bishop takes C6, and again, this... What did we call this? This was Zucker Torts Gambit. If you forget, you can come back over here, hover over it. Yes, Zucker Torts Gambit, named for Johannes Zucker Tort. Do you know who Johannes Zucker Tort is? Um, Zucker Torts Gambit is the most frequently played move. Uh, Johannes Zuckertort and Wilhelm Steinitz were the first two official challengers for the World Championship. They met in 1886. In fact, you can find a playlist on their match where I show only the games that ended in a victory for one player or the other. So, Johannes Zuckertort. Okay, and you can, if you're interested in how that continues, you can just go through and click on all of the moves in the opening. And you can see this change to a modern main line. Zucker Torts Gambit, modern main line. And now you can see when I hover over H6, nothing appears because that portion is not named. So that's the, that's the end of the book line. You can still put in the most popular moves if you're interested, but at least, you know, you have the, the opening line there. Could have done the same with Morphe's defense. Okay, once you're finished with that, go back to your game that was played. And if, if there's a reason you played what you played, you know, you can put a note here. I decided to go after the e-pawn. Takes and takes. Now, I said I thought this was a mistake on Black's part, um, and when I was going over the game, I, I, I mean, when I was entering the moves, I said, 
I think that's probably a mistake because it doesn't regain the material. So here I'm going to demonstrate whether it was a mistake. Well, first thing I'm going to do is go back to my Openings tab, and I immediately notice that, sure enough, knight takes e4 is the most commonly played move. And I can show this. I could just click on these moves and show the line. Well, we attack the queen, and now you're down to below 10, 10 choices. Um, by the way, these numbers, if you click on them, control and click, you can see the list of games that reach that position, all the games and when they were played, and you can click on any one of them or control click if you want to keep the list and, and um, open it in a separate window, and you can see how those games were played out, where they were played, when they were played, by whom they were played. And that's also interesting because you could see how the masters played them out. Um, anyway, we'll just play queen f5 and that's the further we'll go with it. And we'll type in this, this comment. Black should have recaptured the material. Black should, oh, I don't need it to be capitalized, recapture. And I'll type with, knight takes e4, and then after that I'll say, which is the most commonly played move. Boom. Uh, I forgot to turn off my challenges. I've got someone challenging here. Let's go ahead and... Um, hmm, I don't do that here. I'm going to open another window in live chess real quick and turn those challenges off. My apologies. Save. And then I can close that. All right. So we were correct. And we were, were able to show that there was a better move. Now, why was it better than this? Because it regains material equality by failing to play knight takes pawn black allows white to defend his pawn and save his pawn and therefore white is now one pawn in the lead materially so that was um, a mistake on black's part and actually because it was a mistake we're going to change this from a question mark exclam to a full question mark. Okay, the game continued. Bishop e6, bishop g5, pinning his knight. He breaks the pin with his bishop. I developed my knight. He kicks my bishop. Now, I do wonder if this was given his reply. I'll be honest, I did not anticipate this knight takes pawn move. So, given my reply, I wonder, I mean, given his reply, I wonder, was this the best move? Was it best to allow him this uh, tactical shot here or should I have retreated my bishop somewhere along the this path and frankly 
Um, I'm going to have to just save that for my computer analysis because I don't I don't see any clear way to prove that this move, for example, is better. Um, it it certainly takes away this opportunity or this move. One of these two moves might be better than this. Probably not bishop to d2 because that blocks the queen. But one of these two moves might be better, but I can't prove it. I mean, it's very in-depth to try to prove that this would be any better than the move that I chose. So, but I'll put these moves up here, and what I'll do is I'll put a, um, I might make it, mark it as, um, I'll, I'll put the, in, uh, the infinity symbol. Infinity means unclear. So for now, I'll put unclear on that as well as my two alternate suggestions. But this is just reminding me that when I put it through the computer, I want to look at this particular move to see if there was a better choice given his tactic to see if, if uh, it might have been better to retreat my bishop somewhere along the line. And I will let the computer tell me that. I think it might be, but I'm not 100% sure. So because I can't prove it, it doesn't count as a, as a mistake yet. All right, but this was a very clever move by my opponent. I'm going to give that move. It, it either gets an exclam or an exclam question mark. Exclam question mark means it's an interesting move. It's definitely interesting. Um, I don't know. It's certainly not a brilliant move per se. We'll, we'll make it an exclam question mark for now because it is it is quite clever that's for sure discovering an attack against my bishop which is only once defended so in other words two attackers and one defender well that leads to overpower he can overpower on h4 and I played bishop takes, but we do have to evaluate whether or not knight takes or pawn takes, excuse me, knight, pawn takes or knight takes. Still not getting the arrows. There we go. When you have more than one capture available, particularly in the post-game analysis, you want to um, evaluate whether you made the right capture. So to do that, we'll actually page through the, the moves um, that would play out if we capture here. And he can capture here. And if I capture back, he captures with his queen. And... Um, this pawn is a bit weak. Only defended by the knight, although since both of these are higher value than the knight, that should be adequate defense. But uh, we can at least carry it that far. Um, and then we can do the same with the other knight and try to figure out the next few moves if we capture with this knight. Capture. And again, after bishop captures, knight captures, queen captures. Well, this definitely looks better for white than the other alternative, which was here. because the knight is more centralized. But is that better than the position 
that I end up with. We'll again leave that in limbo. Right now, both of these are at least equal. So we'll put equal on both of these. And for now, we will not mark bishop takes e7 as a mistake or as uncertain. But we have failed to prove anyway that either of these moves were better. Therefore, we stick with our our move and we don't mark it as a mistake. Let's continue. Maybe as the continuation goes on, um, it will reveal that this was a mistake after all. But it's too early here to tell. And of course, he has a lot of options. He can capture the bishop with his rook or his queen, or he can do what he did and capture the knight. So we're going to want to evaluate whether either of those two captures were better for black. And uh, it's easy enough to see after only one move that either of these captures would not be good for black because in either case, white ends up with two minor pieces whereas black ends up with only one. So neither of those would be any good for black. You can just mark those both as question marks, double question marks. And so, yeah, he found the best move there. And um, so now we, we took and he took. But again, we need since we have the option of capturing the knight instead of the queen, we want to consider whether or not capturing the knight here would have been a better choice uh, and determine whether that could have been more productive than taking the queen. And here I notice right away that he can take with his queen, creating a battery on the open file, and I'm left with a shattered queenside pawn structure and he's left with a battery on the open file, I can already see that um, taking the knight is not as good as taking the queen. And we do not have to evaluate whether taking the bishop is better than taking the queen here, because that, that should go without saying, shouldn't it? But here, we do want to evaluate whether capturing this knight was better than um, bishop captures and knight captures. And the question is, if we can trap this knight, then um, this is a mistake. Let me say it again. If after bishop takes pawn, knight takes pawn on b2, if white has any means by which he can trap the knight, then he should have pursued that course rather than taking the knight on d1. So let's evaluate that. And the question is, how can we trap the knight? Well, the idea is I want to bring my rook over here Right now, it does not trap the knight because he can run away. But this is the only square to which the knight can run. And I'm already seeing that I can take that square away from his knight by playing pawn to a4. And on my next turn, attack the, the knight, which now has no safe where to go. However, I have to consider whether or not he can save his knight. Because now if he plays his pawn to b5, I can't play the, the rook to b1 because he'll take my pawn on a4. So, so far, the knight is still not trapped. Uh, in this position, I would have to take his pawn... to save my pawn. Well, that does open the file. He would take my pawn, though, and again give himself a defended 
flea square for his knight. However, I immediately notice this pawn is undefended, so I can skewer the knight and the pawn. And when the knight retreats to a4, I can capture the pawn, putting the knight now in danger again, which would then have to retreat to b6. And even before I consider whether or not to capture here, which is clearly the move, if I capture, he captures, I capture, he captures, I capture the pawn, and at the end of this, I end up two pawns in the lead, comparing that to the path that I followed. Um, I am not two pawns in the lead. Therefore, therefore, I can conclude that my move, rook captures the knight, rook, queen's rook captures knight, is a mistake. It might even be a blunder. We'll let the computer tell us whether that was a mistake or a blunder. Now, what's the difference between a mistake and a blunder? Basically, how egregious the mistake is will determine whether we identify it as a mistake or a blunder. It actually seems like it's probably a blunder. I'm going to actually change it to two question marks because, again, if you look at the end of this continuation, I'm an entire two pawns ahead, which should be a winning advantage. So if... I miss an opportunity to gain a winning advantage. That's clearly a blunder. Uh, frankly, here, it's not clear that white has a winning advantage. It's not even clear that white has any advantage because of black's nice move of knight takes e5. The extra pawn that I gained earlier is no longer an extra pawn. The only difference now is the pawn structure. He has a doubled pawn, so that might give me a slight advantage compared to a clearly winning advantage. So that's why we actually just changed it to a blunder. And I'm sort of kicking myself now for not having thought that one through a little bit more deeply. But if I ever end up in a similar situation, you know, this is the, the learning process. I, um, I'll give it a much closer look next time in a similar situation. Well, let me click Save here so I don't lose these notes. You don't forget to click Save every so often, just in case you accidentally erase your notes. You can retrieve them from your archive. Okay. So this was a mistake by me. I'm wondering if this was his best choice here. Generally, you don't want to uh, surrender the open file to your opponent. And by playing rook takes rook and allowing me to recapture with my rook, he is surrendering uh, the open file. So, but since I can't right here prove any, okay, I do have this square to hit on this uh, seventh rank, but I didn't play it. I don't know that he should have allowed me access to this square, so I'm thinking... So my first question is, should he have captured here? I, I'm doubtful that he should have captured. My problem is that I can't prove that um, that was a mistake. In other words, I have to show that he had a better move. What would have been a better move? Um, maybe it would have been better to bring his king toward the center. 
But again, maybe and is are two different things. I'll put the king f8 there and put the infinity sign again. So it reminds me during the computer portion to determine. I get, you know, my gut says he should not have um, allowed me to take control of this file. But definitely, if you're going to allow me to take control of the file, you can't allow me to occupy the seventh rank. So I'm sure this was not his best choice. We're going to give that a question mark exclam. And again, we can change it if we need to after the computer portion. But I get the feeling that definitely here he should have played his, his king over and prevent me. And now that makes me ask the question, why didn't I just play this? Why did I play f3? I'm trying to remember now. Okay, I saw him lift his rook, and I knew he was coming over here. So I gather I played f3 so I could come here and step out of the line of fire. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm sure this is a better move. Because at the very least, it wins this pawn. If nothing else, it wins the c7 pawn. And it's also putting pressure on the entire 7th rank. So I'm going to mark um, f3 as a mistake. Because I definitely have a better move. This is definitely better. How does he defend this? He does not. Therefore, rook e7 was better. Okay, and actually I don't even have to worry about this attack. Even though this pawn is pinned, the f-pawn is defended by the knight. So again, I could have played rook e7 and attacked this pawn. So he gave me two bites at the apple. He should have just played rook e6 here and forced a rook trade. Takes, takes. Um, so rook g6 is at least, well, I'm going to say it's a mistake because it gives me opportunity to really collect on the queen's side. And therefore, this is also a mistake because it failed to collect on the queen's side. And now, now it's too late. Rook takes. Now, we already marked this as a blunder here. And it's a blunder because it allows c4. Therefore, a3 is a blunder because it does not play c4. So here he definitely should have played bishop takes. So that was a blunder. Inexplicably, I didn't uh, exploit it in the game. The only thing I noticed was um, well, even it's not even really much of a danger for, to let him take this pawn because he can get trapped back there. And my king can come up and capture him. Well, but this pawn. Without the rook, that's what it is. Without the rook back here to create defenses, I think I was worried about capture. Oh, but he can't come there with the knight. The knight defends that. Yeah, I was seeing ghosts during the game. Again, the time could have been running short. I mean, it's only move 21, so I don't know how I could have been already short on time, but you never know. So that's a blunder. It doesn't play c4. That's a blunder because it gives a second chance for c4. That's a blunder because it fails to play c4 on the second opportunity. 
That is a blunder because it gives me a third opportunity. I don't know why it doesn't have question marks. All along the way here, all of these moves, first he should have taken this with his bishop. Second, he should have created a place for his bishop to run away, either here or here. And of course, that's also still true here, here, and here. And finally, it dawned on me, wait a minute, that bishop is trapped. It took me three times in the game to notice that it was trapped. And I finally found it and exploited it. And now here, there's a question as to whether I should have taken this right away or if I should have prepared to because I don't actually have to take this bishop until he creates a runaway square. So I should think about whether a different move. What happened in the game, as you can see, is I took, he took, and I gave check. Even if taking and taking turns out to be the best move for me, it's likely that I should have moved this pawn forward first before giving the check, although I suppose he could have stopped the check with h4. Um, what I'm going to do here, I cannot necessarily prove that, yeah, this, this may not be better after all. So again, we'll put an infinity symbol, which means uncertain or unclear, here as well as here. And that's where we use the, our computer resources. If we're not sure and we can't figure it out on our own, we'll use the computer to tell us. So takes, takes, g4 check, king g5. One thing is certain is he's planning to try to pick up a pawn here. So I came over to defend. Now here I am sure that this would have been a better move. I've already got it marked. f4 is clearly better because it threatens checkmate on the next turn. And he has to come up with a way to deal with the checkmate. If he plays here, and I take, and he takes, okay, then I'll have to take, but I still have the threat of mate here. His king is permanently trapped there. He would have to play here that wouldn't work because I'll just play here. Now his king is permanently trapped. So he has no way to save himself against the checkmate. So I'm convinced that uh, knight f1, you know, my original plan was uh, let me box his king in and take away his escape square and totally overlooked that I can still do that here because he can't take because that's checkmate. Because the knight not only gives check, but it, it cuffed, cuts off the runaway square. <laughs> Somehow I did not visualize that. In my mind, I was convinced I had to cut off the square with the pawn, and I failed to visualize that the knight does the same thing. So I played knight f1, but then he helped me out with g5, and I don't know that he really has any way of of saving this anyhow. Well, maybe he should have played g6. So g5 is surely not the best try. Maybe he should just run, run his king back and get it back into the game. One of those two is surely better. Um, but he helped. This is a helpmate. And when I played here, he resigned. 
and the point being that there's nothing he can play to prevent knight to f5 check. Any and every, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine legal moves. Every single one of them results in checkmate. So let's just pick one at random and put that in there. We click save. And um, I showed you how to add notes. And now we run the report. But I'm going to put my mug back on the screen temporarily. I'm actually going to do this now in two parts because we're already over one hour on this video. And so tune in for part two to see how to use your computer resources to confirm your own analysis and to see what you missed during your analysis. Um, there were things I was unclear about during my own personal analysis, and there may be things that I didn't notice at all, and the computer will reveal that to me, and it'll expand my thinking. And so we'll do that in the next video. Um, look for it under Part 2. Until then, have a great day, and play some great chess. Bye now.